David and Jacko, The Zombie Tunnels, by DJ Downey. Scratches in the Night The scratching noises were back. It was the third night I hadn't been able to sleep properly. At first I thought it was because Mum and Dad had bought me a waterbed. I mean, who has one of those? But then I heard it. Scratch. 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 It wasn't high-pitched, like fingers down a chalkboard. It was dull, like the sound you would make if you forcibly dragged your fingers down the back of a bedroom door about 10,000 times, not caring if they were bleeding. Pretty spooky in the dark. Each night they woke me up at about two in the morning. They were soft, but they repeated over and over until I got up and turned on the light. Then they would stop and I would lay awake wondering what the hell it could have been. A possum, perhaps? We'd had possums before. Dad used to feed one by the pool until it bit him and wouldn't let go. <laughs> that was pretty funny. He was cursing and waving him around, and the little beggar wouldn't give. <laughs> Dad ended up jumping in the pool and holding the possum underwater until it swam to the surface to breathe. But this didn't sound like possums. They tend to scuffle with each other and make louder noises, not soft noises like these, and not only when the lights were off and I was in bed. Even my little dog Jacko seemed put off by the noises. He normally slept in my doorway, half on the tiles, half on the carpet. He wasn't allowed on the carpet because of his fleas. But whenever I woke up, he was awake too, looking confused, with his little head cocked to one side. This time, I didn't go back to sleep. I just lay there with the lights on until morning came. I was going to be in a bad mood all day. Brandy. I finally got out of bed when I heard a noise in the kitchen. Even when I wasn't annoyed by scratching noises in the night, I tended to wake up before everyone else. It was both good and bad. Good because I had time to do things I wanted to do. And bad because it could be pretty boring being awake in an empty house for two hours. I wandered down the hallway and into the kitchen. Dad was sitting at our oversized table eating toast and drinking tea, reading the paper. He did that every morning as far as I could tell. I made myself a bowl of cereal and sat down next to him. I like reading the comics so I grabbed a bit of the paper when Dad was refilling his tea. Morning, said Dad, as he looked up from under his glasses. John came up before. I've got some bad news. I was immediately worried about what the news might be. John Moose was my best friend Jalon's dad and lived two houses down from me. The bad news might be they could be moving away, which would make me very unhappy. Brandy's dead. I was shocked. Brandy was Jalon's dog. A lovely big lump of a thing that spent most of its time lying harmlessly in the next door neighbor's garden where nobody could see it. How? I asked. We're not sure, but he had bite marks all over him. We don't know what did it. That's horrible, I said. Yes, he was in his favorite spot. The mooses are burying him in their backyard today. I finished my cereal quietly and Walked out the side of the house and up to the main street. I could see Jalon outside in front of his house, and I walked down to see him. Mate, I said, what happened? He's gone, said Jalon. He's dead. He's dead. Jalon looked forlorn. He'd had brandy since he was three. I couldn't imagine Jacko being dead, let alone bitten to death while sleeping. I'm sorry, mate, I said. Jalon looked up, eyes moist and blinking. Yeah. Something had a go at him, all right. It wasn't just bite marks. Something was eating him. Chunks of flesh were missing all over. Even his insides were half gone. What would have done that on Sabbath Street of all places? I didn't know. We both just looked at each other. The Cupboard That night, the scratches were back again. I slept badly, anticipating them, and sure enough, at around two in the morning, there they were. Soft and spine tingling in the darkness. Scratch. 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 After about five minutes of it, I couldn't take it anymore. The lack of sleep was getting to me, and whatever it was, possum or tree branch, it had to go. Or I had to move bedrooms. I got up quietly in the hope I could find out what was making the sound. I inched off my bed and tipped toad in the darkness towards my window. Scratch. Scratch. Scratch.
scratch. <sighs> I shivered. It really did sound like someone was scratching the wall with their bare, bloodied fingers. But why would they keep doing it over and over and over? It didn't make sense. I peered out the window. No tree branches or possums to be seen. Scratch. Scratch. Unless I was going completely bonkers, it seemed to me that the scratches were coming from within my room. Scratch. Perhaps the possums were in the roof, I thought. Scratch. Scratch. I followed the sounds as though I was in a game of Marco Polo. I might as well have had my eyes shut. It was that dark in my room. The scratching sounds seemed to be coming from the cupboard? Where I kept my clothes? I mean, what the hell? What was this, a bad kids movie? It was probably a possum or perhaps even rats locked in there. I would probably find a nest made of old newspapers and have to clean up the rat poo. By now, Jacko had joined me, cautiously staring at the cupboard. I didn't mind that he was on the carpet. Not that I was scared or anything. Scratch. The sounds were definitely coming from the cupboard. Whatever was making those sounds, and surely it had to be an animal, was right inside. It was freaking me out, so I turned on a little torch and looked at Jack. Well, mate, this is it, I said, and opened the cupboard. The secret tunnel. The cupboard was empty. Well, it was empty except for the clothes that I kept in there and the shoes, and my soccer ball and cricket bat, except for those things. Then I heard it one more time. Scratch. It teetered off softly. And then there was nothing. I looked around with my torch, but I couldn't see any rats or mice or possums or anything that could be making the noise. And yet it had come from my cupboard. It must be in the walls. Ugh, living in the walls. I pulled my clothes out and threw them on the floor. It occurred to me that Mom wouldn't be pleased, but I kept going, throwing the rest of my gear onto the floor until my cupboard was down to empty shelves. I fiddled with one of the shelves until I worked out how to unclip it. I threw it on the floor, too, along with the other five shelves. It was just me and the empty cupboard now. I ran my fingers down the wall. Scratch. Not exactly the same, but close. Perhaps I had a lighter touch. I bent down and crouched on my knees running my hands all over the wall in the torchlight to see if there were any rat holes or the like. Hmm, nothing. I went to get up, but Jack brushed past me into the cupboard and barked. Jacko! I admonished, worried that he would wake Mum and Dad up. I reached out to grab him from the back of the cupboard and lost my balance slightly. I had to lean against the wall to stop myself from falling and squashing him. Click. The wall moved. Ever so slightly. Uh, about an inch. I was confused. I shone my torch all over and saw a black slit on the far left. What the hell? I reached around the slit with my fingers and pulled slightly. The wall slid to the right, revealing darkness. There was a secret tunnel in my bedroom. The zombie. There was no sign of anything that could have made the scratching noises. The tunnel was just big enough for two adults to walk through side by side. My torchlight didn't go very far, but the tunnel seemed to be descending pretty steeply pretty quickly, going under the house as far as I could tell. I had just decided there was no way I was going to find out where it went, at least not in the middle of the night, when Jacko ran past me into the darkness. (sighs) Crap. I went after him. I had no choice. After everything we'd been through together? After the initial rapid descent, the tunnel went left for about 20 meters, and then joined another tunnel, which, as far as I could tell ran the full length of my street. Peering into the tunnel with the help of my torch, I could see side tunnels coming off the main tunnel at regular intervals. The tunnels must connect every house in the street. There was still no sign of Jacko. I had to decide whether to go left or right. And knowing Jacko's tendency to run downhill given a chance, I turned left. My torch only lit up about two meters ahead, so I didn't know what I was in for. I just hoped that he hadn't run into one of the side tunnels. I couldn't stand the thought of him being trapped down here for weeks before meeting a grisly end. Jack, I whispered. jack I wasn't sure why I was whispering. But to be honest, I was still freaked out. So maybe that had something to do with it. It had occurred to me that I could end up the one lost in here for weeks. And all of the side tunnels did look the same. Taking a tip from Hansel and Gretel, 
I retraced my steps and dropped my watch in the middle of the path next to the side tunnel. It was no breadcrumb trail, but at least I would know when to turn right. I headed off back down the hill. After a minute or so, I came across Jacko. He was in the middle of the path, staring at a side tunnel. What's up, mate? I asked softly, pleased to see him. Jack didn't reply, but his little tail did start wagging back and forth quickly, which told me he was pleased to see me. He kept his eyes fixed firmly on the side tunnel. Come on, mate, I said. Time to go home. Jack turned and looked at me. He seemed agitated and in no mood to follow. It was then I heard it again. Scratch. 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 A shiver went down my spine. The sound came from the tunnel. I thought for a moment, and as far as I could tell, this tunnel would lead to the moose's house. For all I knew, the rat or possum or whatever it was, was bothering each of us every night with its scratching. It was strange that Jalon hadn't mentioned it. Perhaps he had been too upset about Brandy. What had happened to Brandy anyway? Okay, mate, I said to Jack. We've come this far. We'd better go see what sort of night creature is making this creepy sound. Perhaps we can catch it. And with that, I crept down the tunnel, slowly, as I knew it would be short. I covered the torch with my hand, reducing the light to a mere shimmer, as not to startle whatever it was making the noise. Scratch. I turned the last Scratch. corner in the tunnel and shone my dim light towards the end. Scratch. A man Scratch. stood facing the wall in the dark, hands by his side, still. Fear gripped my body. His clothes were practically falling apart, and he stank like all stinks in the world, had decided to call this guy home. He stank of rot and slime and dark and dank and spew and gunk and death. He stank of death. Death was the main stink, I decided. He must be homeless. I started to move backwards when the man's right hand slowly reached up high and then pressed against the wall. Scratch. Another chill went through my body. Scratch. There was something Scratch. wrong with the back of this man's hand. It was, well, rotting. Flesh was peeling off, and it was black in places, like it was frostbitten. From what I could tell, his fingers didn't look so good either. I wasn't sure if they were all there, but they left a bloody trail on the wall as he scratched. I was really freaked out now, petrified. I had to get out of there before this guy, who was clearly homeless and on drugs, spotted me. He probably killed Brandy. With his teeth. That's when Jacko barked. Now, Jacko and I are normally the best of mates and go out of our way to look after each other. But at this moment, I didn't really think he had my best interests at heart. Perhaps the shock of seeing this guy had defeated his usual good sense. It didn't really matter why. The man's hand dropped to his side and he moaned. He moaned. What sort of man moans? It was awful. Slow and deep and terrifying. I was so scared I couldn't move. Literally, I was frozen. Listening to a moan that could have come from someone dying of the plague. Then he turned around slowly and looked at me. His face was a nightmare. One eye was deflated and half oozing out of his skull. Bits of his face were missing, as though they had rotted and fallen off. One of his lips was gone, and I could see his teeth, which were brown and yellow and crumbling. There were also chunks missing from his filthy hair, as though his whole head was decomposing while he was still alive. How could this guy still be alive? Was he? I didn't want to find out but I still couldn't move. I was stuck. He put out both his hands towards me and continued moaning. He was only about two meters away. One foot shuffled out in front and then the other. He walked awkwardly, as though he didn't really know how to or had lost his balance. He moved slowly, but if I didn't work out how to break my terror lock, then he was going to wrap those putrid hands around me in about ten seconds. Seven seconds. Five seconds. Now it was me moaning. Three seconds. Then, like a bullet out of a gun, 
Jacko was off. Snarling and using his legs only three inches long, he ran straight towards the hideous creature. Using the only attack method at his disposal, he bit hard onto the man's ankles and started shaking his head back and forth. The man paused and looked down at Jacko, thrashing at his feet, as though a fly had landed on him. Jack thrashed even harder. I could see the man's skin tearing as he did so. The man moaned some more and reached down with his disgusting hands towards my little friend. The threat to Jack seemed to give me strength, and I swung my arms towards his bent head. I connected with a dull foot, and I could feel his flesh give way beneath my fist. He swiveled to one side before slipping to his left. Jacko, who was near his right, was flung off and landed rough near the wall. The creature's foot had detached and was planted firmly in Jacko's mouth. Come on, mate, I said hurriedly. Let's get out of here. Without waiting for a response, I scurried down the tunnel and turned right to return home. Jacko followed right beside me. In the distance, I could hear the creature following us, one leg awkwardly dragging behind the other. Within moments, we were back to my watch, which I collected before turning right again into my own tunnel and heading into my cupboard. I fiddled with the sliding door and managed to click it back into place before returning to my room and turning on my light. Jacko sat beside me, looking pleased with himself. He had a decomposing foot in his mouth. Before I could do anything, my door burst open. It was Dad, who was well prone to opening my door without any notice, no matter what the situation. He had his shirt off and seemed to be looking for something. Have you seen my glasses? He asked. He looked at me as I was still panting and then down at Jacko, who still had a foot in his mouth. Dad squinted at the foot for a moment. Hey, nice foot, he said. Did Grandma buy that for you? I mumbled something about the magic shop, but Dad was already looking through the junk on my desk. After he left, I collapsed in the bed. Jack may have been proud of himself, but I was in a bad way. I was shaking, no doubt in shock. What had just happened? There was no way that guy could have been alive. Half of his face was missing for starters, and he didn't react at all when his foot came off in Jacko's mouth. And why did his foot come off anyway? That didn't make sense. Jacko was so small. The guy either had leprosy or... Well, either that or he was dead. Dead and walking around, attacking people. Like something in the movies. Like a zombie. My brain didn't want to believe that, as I tend to be a pretty rational kid. But there was no other explanation for it. I had just been attacked by a zombie. Jacko yelped. I looked down. He had dropped the foot, which was now on the floor. I went to pick it up and one of the toes moved, then another. The dead foot was still alive, so to speak. It started inching its way towards Jacko, toe length by toe length. It would have been comical if it wasn't so disgusting. What was it going to do if it made its way to my dog? Tickle it? I put the basket over the foot, which trapped it for the time being. I was exhausted. I laid back onto the bed and thought for a moment. What did I know about zombies? Mm, very little. The movie said you had to smash their brains to kill them. And if they bit you, then you could turn into a zombie yourself. Whether or not that was true was anyone's guess. All I knew was that I was tired. I had been attacked by a zombie and hadn't slept in four nights. It was time for some ketchup. The Foot and the Potatoes I woke and licked my lips. They were dirty, and I was thirsty. I looked down and saw Jacko asleep on the carpet. My bin was knocked over next to him. My bin! I sat up right quickly. My head hurt. Perhaps I was sick. Did I really have a fight with a zombie last night? It seemed unlikely. I hopped out of bed. My clothes on the shelves were still all over the floor, so at least I hadn't dreamed that bit. I took a look at my cupboard, which didn't seem half as scary in the daylight. Not scary at all, in fact. Pretty confident I was being foolish, I pressed against the back of the cupboard wall. It clicked open, and I pulled it aside to reveal the tunnel. Still as dark as I remembered. Jacko was awake, too, and I picked him up. He smelled of cabbages and rotting fish. It was real. It all happened. I quickly closed up the tunnel door and shut my cupboard. I rammed a chair up against it so it couldn't be open from the inside, at least not easily. Head spinning, I walked with stinking Jacko under my arms, down the hallway to the kitchen where Mom and Dad were eating breakfast. 
Hi, Davy, said Mum. Have a good sleep? We were a bit worried about you, said Dad. You've been asleep all day and all night. That explained the headache. I was dehydrated. I took Mum up on her offer for orange juice and took a deep swig. It helped, and I took another. You haven't seen Jalon, have you? asked Mum. Yeah, yesterday we spoke about Brandy, I said, refreshed. Why? It's just that John was up asking after him before, she said. Apparently Jalon was gone this morning, and John thought that he might have gone down to the creek with you to fish for yabbies. I was immediately alarmed. My best mate was missing, and I knew for a fact that a rabid zombie lived in a tunnel that led directly to his room, and that that zombie had eaten his dog just yesterday. But I couldn't tell my parents. What would they think? I knew what I thought. The zombie had either eaten Jalon, or Jalon had explored the tunnels as I did and gotten trapped down there. But if the zombie had eaten Jalon, then I was pretty confident that his parents would have found his body just as they did Brandy's. So that meant Jalon was trapped in the tunnels. Tunnels that contained at least one member of the species of the living dead. I had to do something. I excused myself from breakfast and thought of a plan. It was pretty simple. I had to go back down into the tunnels and rescue my friend. I had to assume that meant that I was going to run back into the zombie. I had to be prepared. I went into my brother's room and looked under his bed. He kept all his precious things under there, such as his prized baseball bat that our Uncle Bill had given him for his fifth birthday. It was way too big for him, but I thought it would be fine for my purposes. That is, to smash a zombie's brains out. I started towards my room when my mother called out again. Oh, David, can you take this foot away, please? I found it in the pantry, and its toes were waggling at the potatoes. Dad said Grandma bought it for you, but I don't like it. It really stinks. I ran and grabbed the foot. The toes were waggling, as Mum said. She and Dad were getting ready for a walk, so I waited until they put their shoes on and left before I put the foot in the microwave. One minute should do it, I thought. Uh, or perhaps ten minutes would really do it. The microwave started, and the foot went around and round. The toes waggled and then waggled some more. Soon they were waggling furiously. Uh, what else could they do, I thought. They couldn't die, as they were already dead, so I guessed they would just keep waggling, at least until... The foot exploded at the six-minute mark. The toes weren't waggling then. By ten minutes, they were just charred chunks of flesh. I spent another ten minutes scrubbing the microwave, wishing that I'd put the damn foot in the garbage can. If Mum caught a whiff of exploded zombie foot in her oven, she would kill me. I used some extra disinfectant at the end just to make sure and made a mental note to never again eat the microwaved frozen vegetables with dinner. Finally, I grabbed my bat and my own secret weapon, a slingshot and some ball bearings, along with a ball of string and a head torch Dad used when caving. I tucked my slingshot into my pants and headed back into the tunnel to look for my friend. Jalon I started out in my tunnel again. I was scared, of course, and cautious. I tied a string to the end of my bed and let it dangle out behind me so that, when the time came, I would be able to find my way home in the dark. The head torch wasn't bad, and I could see a bit farther than I could the last time. There was no sign of Jalon or the zombie. I didn't know which way to go, but I assumed that he would have gone downhill as I had. So I made my way past his house, Jacko trailing behind. He seemed a little less confident than he had in his foot assault. I kept going for about three minutes, which was a long time in a dark tunnel. At that point, I came to a T-junction, where I had to choose left or right. I stopped and listened. There was no scratching or moaning to be heard. Jalon, I whispered, too scared to speak any louder. Jalon, are you down here, mate? There was no reply, but ever so faintly I could hear water trickling towards the right. I figured that would be the way he would head, if only to get a drink of water after a night in the tunnels. I headed in that direction, which tended down farther into the ground. A couple of minutes and several twists and turns later, I came into an enlarged cavern. I looked around, and rocks on the roof sparkled in the light of my head torch. The path was surrounded by streams of black water, some of which had rocky growths that reached all the way to the ceiling. I saw something lying next to the pond on the other side of the cavern. I crept closer and hid behind some rocks. Whatever it was, it dragged itself over to the creek edge and cupped some water in its hands before drinking deeply. I took a guess a zombie wouldn't do anything like that and called out. Jalon? The shape looked up, and my torchlight fell directly on it. David? It was Jalon. 
but he didn't look to be in good shape. He looked tired and drained, and his eyes were bloodshot. I hurried over to my friend and touched his shoulder. Mate, are you all right? What happened? Jalon explained how he too had been awakened night after night by the scratching, and he too had explored the tunnel. What else was a curious boy to do after all? I just explored and explored. I wasn't scared at all, but then my torch stopped working and I got lost. Then something attacked me. Attacked you? I said. Are you okay? The bastard bit me of all things. He was really slow and I was able to run away. I followed the water sound and ended up here a few hours ago. I don't feel well, though. I'm really thirsty. I didn't know how to tell him that he was attacked by the living dead. It just didn't make sense, even to me, and I knew it was true. So did Jacko, who was pleased to see Jalon as well. Come on, mate. Let's get you home. I helped him up and he winced. This is where the bastard got me, Jalon said, pulling up his sleeve. I gasped at the sight of it. A mouth-sized chunk of flesh was missing from his arm. Strangely, it wasn't bleeding. Instead, it seemed to be festering as though already infected. It's nothing, mate. Here, let me help you, I said. I started walking him out of the cavern. It was then that we heard the moan. It was the same moan as before, quiet and awful, but this time it reverberated through the cavern as though a choir of zombies were taunting me. What the hell was that? said Jalon, tired. I've heard it a few times. Eh, don't worry about it, mate, I said. Everything's going to be fine. Let's just follow the string. We'll be home in a jiffy and get you some help. I couldn't tell where the moan was coming from. With the reverberations, it seemed to be coming from everywhere. We shuffled along together, me supporting his weight as we followed the string. We took one turn, then another, until I would have felt quite lost if it wasn't for the string. All the time, the moaning continued until it seemed to be even closer. Finally, we took a turn, and I really didn't recognize it at all. And sitting there, on the floor was the revolting zombie with the string coming out of his mouth. He was eating it. And it had led us right to him. <laughs> he moaned some more at the side of us and attempted to get up, despite his missing foot. What the hell? screamed Jalon. What is it? It's what bitch you made. It's either a crazy guy on drugs or a zombie. I think it's a zombie or something like that. We've got to be careful, mate. I think it's what ate your dog, and it'll eat us too if it gets the chance. Jalon tensed in horror. I was also petrified, but unlike last time, I knew what to expect. Sort of. The zombie started lurching towards us. Given Jalon's state, there wasn't really much point running as I wasn't about to leave a mate behind. The zombie was about ten meters away and closing. We had to come up with a plan. I let Jalon slump on the ground and I pulled out my slingshot. I took a handful of ball bearings from my pocket and loaded them into the pouch. I pulled back the rubber strap and let rip at the lumbering horror that approached. At that range, the ball bearings had no choice but to hit their mark. And with some force, one tore into the creature's cheek and another into his throat. A third took out his good eye, which meant, at least to me, that he should be blind as his bad eye surely wasn't good for anything except drooping down his cheek. The creature moaned some more but didn't otherwise seem too put out by his lack of sight. He kept coming at us, arms outstretched. Come on, mate, I whispered. This is our chance. We need to slip by him. I lifted Jalon again by the arm and moved him to the far right of the tunnel, away from the zombie's approach. The zombie kept going in a straight line, so the plan seemed to be working. We inched our way down the tunnel wall, getting closer and closer to the zombie. Jacko followed behind us reluctantly. My heart raced faster and faster as the zombie approached. It seemed like time slowed, but eventually he was right next to us on the left side of the tunnel as we huddled on the right. The zombie chose just that moment to let out a particularly gruesome moan. Jalon, who still seemed to be in shock and hadn't had time to process the horror of what was happening, groaned in return. It sounded limp and pathetic compared to the voice of the undead, but it was loud enough to get the zombie's attention. The creature swerved to the right, arms outstretched. I dropped Jalon again to the ground and brought up my own arms to ward the zombie off. His bloody fingers wrapped around my left arm and slowly pulled me closer to him. I shot out my right arm into his chest to stop him. We stood in the slow embrace for a moment before his teeth started chomping. Chomp, 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 chomp. 
Obviously, whatever process a zombie's brain engages in had determined that it was time for him to devour some flesh. My flesh! He pulled me harder and harder. Clearly, zombies were strong because I was having trouble keeping him away. In fact, there was no doubt he was stronger than me because I seemed to be getting drawn closer and closer. Jacko was growling and gnawing at the zombie's bloody leg stump, but that didn't seem to phase him in the slightest. I was now only five inches away from the zombie's face. His lips were half missing. I could see exactly what I was headed towards. He didn't seem to be taking a breath as such, but up this close, the stench of death made me even weaker. Chomp, 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 chomp. I was only three inches away from the zombie's chomping teeth now. They were crumbling and rancid, but could clearly tear some flesh. I was coming to my end. Chomp, 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 chomp. By this stage, my face was right next to his mouth. I closed my eyes and hoped it would be quick. Ah! Cried Jalan as he leapt off the floor and smashed down a giant rock on the zombie's head. It crushed his skull and the chomping stopped. Brains oozed out of his crushed skull as the creature collapsed to the floor, dead, a second time. Jalon collapsed down in a heap next to him. The final walk. I, too, slumped down the wall. The three of us lay on the tunnel floor, a zombie with its brain smashed out, a sick boy with a festering bite, and his neighbor and best mate, who was mentally and physically exhausted from almost getting chomped to death by the undead. Jacko also lay next to the three of us, with his head on his front paws, tongue out, and panting. We all stayed in these positions for five minutes or so without speaking. The situation was almost too terrible to process. I got up off the floor when a little of my strength returned. I moved over to Jalon, who was still slumped over where he had fallen after his rock attack. Jalon, I said, it's over. We've done it. The creature is dead. You killed it. Jalon's eyes opened but he didn't seem to see me. I... I don't feel so good, he whispered. Come on, mate. I'll help you. I tried to pick him up, but he was dead weight. His eyes were closed again. Jalon? Jalon's eyes opened, slowly. Just a little. Sorry, mate. His eyes closed altogether, and he was still. He was dead. My best mate was dead. Killed by a zombie in a tunnel under a street. My heart broke. I had never felt like this before. I clutched my childhood friend close and sobbed at his loss in mine. I knew I had to get up, though. I had seen too many movies. I picked up my baseball bat and waited. I waited for five minutes, then ten, and then five more, watching my friend the whole time. Eventually, it happened. His eyes flicked open. They were cloudy, but still fixated on me. A low, guttural moan came from his mouth. As he sat up, his teeth started chomping as I swung the bat. It smashed into his jaw and his neck snapped to one side. My second blow was to his skull. Jalon wouldn't have wanted to remain a zombie. Home. Eventually, I found my way home. My torchlight was almost exhausted by the time I got there. The zombie had eaten my string, so it hadn't been easy. I felt tired and sick to my stomach beyond words. In my own mind, I had aged about five years, which was a lot to me. It was almost nighttime. I found some boards down the side of the house, as well as some nails and Granddad's old hammer. I hammered up the back of the cupboard as best I could after I put some big pieces of junk in the tunnel to block it. I didn't want any more evening visitors. I crawled into my bed with Jacko and slept. 